Shields up, Iron Breakers. We're Akan here coming at you with another edition of the Cons Cast. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about Dragon's Dogma on the Nintendo Switch. This title was sent to me by Capcom so that I could give it a look and tell you guys my opinions on it. And I realize that I'm a little bit late on this particular topic, and that is because I've been uh, pretty busy. I had to take a, a trip all the way into the States. Uh, you guys will be hearing more about that in the future as soon as I'm allowed to talk about it. But for now, let's focus on the subject at hand. I mean, it shouldn't really be news for anyone that I'm a huge fan of Dragon's Dogma, considering that I have, like, what, three playthroughs recorded on the channel, plus the playthroughs that I've done uh, outside of the channel itself just for fun. So I've played this game quite a few times, so my opinion on it goes way beyond the little time that I've put uh, on the Nintendo Switch. My main concern with the Nintendo Switch version was naturally how did it look visually, how did it look in terms of performance and all of that stuff. And I guess I will start with that and then we'll move on for what the game is actually about for people that don't actually know what Dragon's Dogma is all about. So in terms of performance, I mean, we also have to consider the fact that this is a game that was running on the PlayStation 3. And on the PlayStation 3, it did have uh, significant frame drops in a lot of situations. Uh, performance was an issue. I remember that. It never really prevented me from greatly enjoying the game regardless. But there were definitely issues of performance on the PlayStation 3. There is no denying that whatsoever. However, on the Nintendo Switch, what I can tell you is that I haven't really experienced any significant performance issues. I mean, I've had some during one of the cutscenes uh, where I noticed that was a little bit choppy for like a millisecond, but it didn't really last. And throughout all of the time that I spent running over the open world, all of the visual effects that I've seen so far, which arguably is not that deep into the game. I think I'm about, I don't know, five hours in, something like that. Um... And uh, pretty much the performance is pretty solid. Now, naturally, it is running on 30 FPS, as we would expect. At least that's what it seems like to me. Like I always say, I don't really have the equipment to accurately check the, the frames per second on a console. But at the same time, it feels pretty smooth. A lot smoother than it did on the PlayStation 3. But naturally, uh, I don't think it runs quite as well as it does on the PlayStation 4. And uh, there's also not as much visual fidelity. However, having said that, the textures of Dragon's Dogma have never really been its super strong point, so to speak, you know? Like, they, do, they looked a little bit aged even back on the PlayStation 4, but that does not detract from the experience at all. I mean, I still think the visuals look really good. I like the art style. I like the animations. I think in terms of animations, particularly Dragon's Dogma is freaking fantastic. Just the amount of stuff that you can do while in combat is probably one of the most freeing combat systems that I've seen in quite a while. It might take you a bit to adapt to the controls, not because of the Nintendo Switch version, but because of just the nature of how the controls actually work on Dragon's Dogma, but once you get it, it's just so good. But yeah, in terms of performance, sound, visuals, everything that I've experienced so far is super solid. Uh, I don't think that anyone is going to start playing Dragon's Dogma on a Switch and be like, oh man, it's so choppy, it doesn't feel right. None of that. At least I haven't experienced any of that whatsoever. So from that end, if you know what Dragon's Dogma is all about and your concern is performance, visuals, all of that stuff, all I can tell you is that you are not going to regret it. It looks good, it plays good, it feels good, okay? So now let's talk about the game itself because there might be a lot of people out there that the Nintendo Switch is the only console that they have. Maybe you've never played Dragon's Dogma before on PlayStation 3, PS4, or PC. So what is the, what can you expect from this game? Well, for starters, let me tell you something. This game starts slow very slow. It is going to take you quite a few hours before you can actually start to get a, a grasp of what the story is all about. What I can tell you is that once you actually finish a game, there is a lot of payout for all the buildup and all of the things that have been happening throughout the story of the game. There is a huge payout. So throughout the game itself, sometimes the story might feel like, oh man, I'm just not feeling it, you know? Sometimes it might feel like that. However, it is important to mention that the gameplay more than makes up for that feeling that you might get throughout the story in the in the interim of the game, so to speak. But when you actually get to the ending, you will see a huge payoff for everything that you've experienced in the game. And it's really cool. And by the way, this game actually has almost 
two separate stories. I mean, they're interconnected, but in a lot of ways, they're experienced separately, uh, which is the, um, the DLC that it came with, which is Bitter Black Isle. Now, uh, the main campaign is its own thing, and then the Bitter Black Isle is... I would almost consider it to be a, a side story, which does connect to the main campaign, but is not essential to it. And um, the, um, the DLC in and of itself is much more enclosed. Um, it has very interesting bosses. It has a lot of interesting combat. It's got new skills, new abilities, new things. But personally, I always liked the original better in terms of feel because you know and the originally you just like you go out into the field and there's massive open world that you can run around do quests and do stuff uh and, it, and i always found that pretty cool and the, the dark arisen expansion really went the dark route it's like it's, it's just this massive dungeon delve that you go into and uh it's still really cool mind you so both of them are cool uh, I like the stories of both of them. Uh, so in terms of that, that is what you can expect. So this is an RPG. Uh, I wouldn't consider it a traditional open world. Um, this, this particular open world is very... It feels very old school. You actually go to like these different mission boards and you pick up missions and then you can do them. And some of the missions... Some, sometimes it's even weird because you get into this mode where you just go into a, a board and you just pick up all the quests and suddenly it's like, Oh, now I'm doing an escort quest. Whoops. And, you, and when you accept an, ex, an escort quest, you have to actually escort the person. Like, there's no, no backsies. Like, that person will not leave your party until he either dies and you fail the quest or you, uh, you complete the quest. Which, by the way, you can fail quests. Uh, you can fail quests, particularly escort quests in this game. And you will not be able to take those quests again until you go into New Game Plus, which the game also has. Uh, New Game Plus. So this is just to kind of give you a, an idea of the structure of Dragon's Dogma, which is it's very unconventional. Uh, but at the same time, I find that to be a good thing, because why would you just want, oh, let's all streamline everything into this formula with, you know, uh, a checkbox of list of things to do. It's like, in this game, you only really need to invest yourself in whatever you want. It's like, oh, I want to do side quests, or you don't want to do side quests. You want to do main quests and focus on that. Um, one of my advices would also have to be, this game is going to feature uh, something uh, that you can do on your very first playthrough, which is hard mode. If this is your first time playing Dragon's Dogma, I would heavily advise you against going in hard mode. The gameplay that you guys are watching is actually going to be from hard mode. Now, the reason I play in hard mode is because it is a faster experience, so to speak, but at the same time, it is brutally punishing if you do not know what you are getting yourself into. So, normal mode, will play just like normally and I would advise if it is your first playthrough playthrough in normal mode like really enjoy the game because hard mode you can expect to get one shotted like that like literally like that and sometimes by enemies that don't even look that menacing at all like you'll see an enemy he's got like oh he's got some chain mail you know a wooden shield and the sword he'll come up to you he'll swipe at you once you're dead like, that literally happens in hard mode, particularly at the start. It becomes easier as you progress because you start upgrading your gear, you start getting um, more stuff and whatnot. But the start of hard mode, you're, you're just like, you're dead all the time, which is why a lot of the footage that you guys will watch will probably include me using a bow. Um, because it's just a lot easier when you're playing in hard mode to stay out of range uh, for, for the beginning of, of the fights. So yeah, I would advise you guys to start in normal mode if this is your first time playing uh, the Dragon's Dogma. But uh, other than that, the gameplay itself is where everything is when it comes to this game. So you're going to be creating your character and you're going to be able to pick from uh, three classes at the very start. You can be a mage, a strider, which is like a rogue with a bow, or you can be a fighter, which is your basically sword and board class. Now, the very important thing about this decision of these three classes is that you will be able to swap classes at will as you progress through the game, but it is important to mention that as you swap classes, the class that you level up as is going to influence the stats that your character gets. Now, if you're doing a normal playthrough, like I told you, you know, for your first playthrough, you're trying it out for the very first time, I wouldn't focus too much on the meta, so to speak. I wouldn't focus too much on min-maxing your character because you should focus more on having fun. 
on your first playthrough. Min-maxing, you should leave for like a second playthrough or something like that. Because eventually, as you begin to learn more about the leveling up of your character and whatnot, you will learn that, for instance, in order to make the best magic archer or mystic knight, you actually need to play as a mage in order to significantly increase your magical attack power. Because that's how it works. If you're playing, not as a mage, as a sorcerer, actually. If you're playing as a sorcerer, you get like the best attack power increase. If you're playing as an assassin, you get the best physical attack power increase. If you're playing as a ranger, I think, if you're playing as a ranger, you're going to get the best stamina increase. And these are all important things for the building of your character that you will need to decide when it comes to min-max. So not only you have a cool experience for someone that just wants to have fun, you can also have a really interesting experience for someone that wants to really min-max a character to the maximum of their ability. And there are many different ways in which you can really build up a character um, in order to achieve different results. Like you can go all into Assassin and then switch to like a Ranger and you're gonna have crazy uh, range damage. Or you can go all into a Mage and then switch into a Magic Archer. N not Mage, all, all into Sorcerer, sorry. I, I always mix up Mage and Sorcerer, it's very different. Uh, you can go all the way into Sorcerer and then you can uh, roll into Magic Archer and you can deal massive amounts of damage with uh, your magic bow. So there's a lot of stuff in there, right? Um, so there's, um, like I said, there's all these different classes that you can play as, which all offer different play styles. But I think that I should emphasize one thing in particular, and that is that um, the sorcerer class in this game, like, you know how in a lot of games you have, uh, oh, I'm going to shoot my little fireball as a mage, and you get a, a little fireball that goes off and hits the monster, like, yay, I shot my fireball. In this game, while it starts like that, you shoot a little fireball, you shoot a little bit of ice here and there, and I don't really have footage that I, well, maybe I'll, I'll get some older footage from a playthrough or something, but basically, when you get to the later levels, your spells are going to look apocalyptic, which is friggin' fantastic. Like, I'm talking you will literally rain down meteors from the sky, and it's not like a little... A small little area of effect circle where little balls come down, you know, little balls of fire come down. It's not like that. In this game, when you're talking about raining meteors from the sky, you're talking literally the sky darkens and you start seeing these friggin' huge boulders of flames falling from the sky. And I'm not talking close to your party, just like they're spread out all over the place. There's like massive meteors raining down on your enemies or you can summon massive hurricanes. And it's just the visual effects on the, on the later spells are extremely impressive. And it's something that I've personally always appreciated. Even though I don't really play mage, I tried playing mage, but mage is just not for me because you have to actually cast the spells and stuff. And I'm, I'm just like more into faster action, melee, that kind of stuff. Uh, I think the Mystic Knight might be my favorite class. It's been doing that and the Assassin, which is weird saying that I like Assassin, but Assassins in this game can actually use uh, Sword and Shield. But anyway, I wouldn't be doing uh, this game justice if I didn't mention its uh, awesome grapple system. So this is something that I believe was probably inspired by Shadow of the Colossus. Those of you who've played Shadow of the Colossus will know that you climb on top of these giant looking creatures and then eventually you deliver um, a fatal blow. In this game, they uh, elaborated on that by basically allowing you to climb anywhere and attacking anywhere onto a creature. And depending on where you attack, you might even have uh, different outcomes. So for instance, if you want to um, fight a Cyclops, you'll actually have to climb it on top of his head and hit it in the eye, and that is where you will deal the most damage. Sometimes the Cyclops might have a helmet, at which point you'll have to bash on the helmet, and he gets tired of listening to, to it and the ringing of his ears, so he takes the helmet off so that you can then hit him in the face. So there's a lot of... Um, a lot of mechanics like that that are particularly satisfying. And then if you are a mage, don't think that like, oh, but I'm not going to be doing any of this cool climbing stuff. Well, yes, but if you're a mage, you'll be able to uh, identify the weaknesses of each monster and take advantage of it that way. So like, for instance, Cyclopses are weak to lightning. So you hit a Cyclops with lightning and he might fall over and thus granting an opportunity to the rest of your party to really dish out some damage. And speaking of party, uh, you will be playing this game as a party of four. I mean, if that is what you want, you can play the game solo, but the game is tuned for you to be playing it as a party of four. And while the game does not have multiplayer, which is what I think one of its biggest flaws, um, you're going to have this this um, NPC that you create for yourself, which is your pawn. And um, 
you will actually be able to customize all the aspects of his character. You'll be able to level him up as an individual character as well. Uh, and you can even um, manipulate his AI to make him more of a healer or make him more of an offensive fighter, make him more of a scrapper that just cleans out um, weaker monsters. There's a lot of customizability that you can add on top of your pawn, uh, as well as you can decide which class you want. With the exception, there's a couple of advanced classes that pawns can't be, like Mystic Archers and uh, Assassins, and I don't remember what the other one is. I think that there's one more, but I know that at least... No, Mystic Archers, um, Magic Archers, Mystic Knights, and Assassins. They can't be those three classes. Uh, but other than that, they can be any class that you want. You can level up their class, give them skills, decide which skills they use. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you can actually do with your pawns, which is cool because the way that the game then works is that uh, you and your pawn makes two in your party, but you can add two more in your party where you go into this rift. And the, when you go into the rift, you can actually gain access to pawns of other players. So say, for instance, you have a friend that is also playing the game. You can recruit his pawn into your party. So he will be, you know, creating like a mage pawn or something like that, and you can bring his mage pawn with all of the settings and all of the AI and all of the equipment that he has, you can bring him into your party for free. Like, because there's um, special pawns that you can get through this uh, special in-game currency called, uh, what's Rifts? Is it Rift Crystals? I, I forget what, what, what the name of the currency is. Um, but... The way that then works is that people can also rent out your pawn and uh, your friend can also use your pawn. And when he uses your pawn, your pawn then comes back with Rift Crystals, which is a currency that you get in game for renting out your pawn and you can buy special items with it and stuff like that. But it's it's a really interesting system if you have more people that, um, that play with you. They can also send you gifts uh, through your pawn. Uh, I remember that a lot of people used to play with my pawn back in, uh, in PlayStation 3 and even PlayStation 4. Because it was, it was just fun. <laughs> it's, it's just really good fun. It's a really cool system, uh, the way that that worked out. And I would really advise you guys to engage with it. Because the way it happens is your main pawn levels up with you, but the other two pawns don't. So it kind of forces you to go back from time to time and get better pawns. Otherwise, you would be playing the game at level 30, and you would still be rocking pawns that were like level 10. That's not going to work out. You have to go into the rift constantly and update your pawns, which also allows you to experiment with the buildup of your party, right? You can have a party that consists of, you know, two melee fighters and two mages or two archers, a melee fighter and a mage and that kind of stuff. I, I keep saying mage because mage is the class that heals. So there's the mage that heals. Then there's a sorcerer that actually does more offensive spells. Um... And there's just something really cool about constantly tweaking your team to best suit your abilities and, you know, also depending on the enemies that you are facing, you might want more, you might want more magic damage, you might want more um, me uh, melee damage or more range damage, whatever. You can constantly adjust your party and tweak things around to, um, to basically constantly min-max, even if you aren't min-maxing your character, you can kind of like min-max through your party. Which is, uh, it's just really cool. This is just a game that I've really, really enjoyed every time that I've played it. And I'm really happy to see it come to the Nintendo Switch. Particularly because it runs well. That's the thing. It runs well. Which I really didn't expect. I thought, man, I'm going to get into this and it's going to run like crap. But, you know, for the, for the Switch, I think it runs pretty damn good. 30 FPS, pretty solid throughout most of what I've played so far. And just, it's the real thing. It's a really fun game. It'll give you lots and lots of hours of entertainment if you've never played it before. Naturally, if you've played it before, then you'll know what you're getting yourself into. Also, if you've played it before and you never actually got to play the Dark Arisen DLC, this might be a good time to jump into that. I mean, I don't know. It's up to you guys. But either way, let me know what you think about Dragon's Dogma in the comment section down below. Thank you very much for watching. If you guys enjoyed this video, hit it up with a like. If you're new here, subscribe. Hit the bell notification icon. I'll see you guys on the next one. Stay strong and may your shields never break.